Order. Uh, and let me begin by thanking all of our panelists for being here for uh, what will be, I think, a very important discussion for tens of millions of families in this country. You know, as a nation, uh, we often talk about family values and how much we love our children, uh, but unfortunately, we have a funny way of showing that love. Uh, in America today, we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. And we have, as we will be discussing today, a broken and dysfunctional child care system. Uh, it is no great secret uh, that the psychologists tell us that the most important years of human intellectual and emotional development are zero through four. That is what the psychologists tell us. Yet there are very few people, I think, who will uh, come to the conclusion in this country that we provide our youngest children with the kind of love and care and attention that they need. And that really is disgraceful. The young people are the future of America, and in many ways we have turned our backs on them. Uh, we are the richest country in the history of the world, and there is no excuse if we got our priorities right why we should not be providing the highest quality of childcare for the little ones and to ease problems for their parents. Uh, again, I don't have to tell anybody who is here that in America today, the cost of childcare for a variety of reasons is outrageously high and unaffordable to millions and millions of working class and middle class families. Uh, in Vermont, which I think it's about the national average, it's about $15,000. Here in D.C., as your staff will tell you, if you have any kids who have staff, uh, if you have any uh, staff who have children, they will tell you, you know what child care is in D.C.? It's about $30,000 a year, which is very, very high. Imagine $30,000 a year if you got a two-year-old. Uh, and how can a working-class family, people make $50,000, $70,000 a year, afford to spend $15,000 a year on child care or even more? Uh, and the result of that is that according to a recent survey, 40% of parents in America have gone into debt due to the cost of childcare, and nearly 30% have had to make unacceptable choices of paying for childcare or paying their rent or mortgage. In other words, you want to have a kid in America and you're working class? Well, we're going to make you pay for that, boy. You're going to go deeply in debt. Thank you for having a child. Not exactly what I think we should be doing as a nation. Uh, all over, not only... Uh, is the cost of child care outrageously high. Uh, for families in most parts of this country, it is very, very difficult to find a slot. And I will not surprise anybody on this committee because you've all heard the story. People get pregnant and the first thing they do is call up a child care center or a place trying to find a spot. And they're told, well, maybe, but in all likelihood you'll be uh, on a waiting list. Uh, and the other point that I would make is not only that childcare is terribly expensive, not only that is, is that there are not enough slots. If we appreciate the kids and we understand how important care is for the little kids, obviously the conclusion is you're going to respect the people who work with the children, who you can argue do some of the most important work in America, nurturing the little children. And yet we are paying in this country those workers outrageously low wages. We're paying them starvation wages. Uh, and we're talking about paying people $13, $14 an hour. And the result of that is tens of thousands of people are leaving the profession. They can make more working in McDonald's than they can nurturing our little children. And the last point that I would make is if you think this is just about the little children and you think it's about the parents, you're wrong. It's also about the economy. All right. Now, nobody has the exact numbers, but I have heard that there are at least many, many hundreds of thousands of people, mostly women, who would like to enter the workforce. They can't because they cannot find quality, affordable childcare. Now, we made progress in the American Rescue Plan. Finally, the United States Congress said, you know, we appreciate our children. We appreciate our workers. We appreciate our parents. We're going to do something about it. And we significantly increased funding for childcare. Not enough but we made some progress. And right now, though, we are at a precipice where that funding may disappear. 
That funding kept over 200,000 child care providers in business, sustained child care for nearly 10 million kids, and prevented a million child care workers from losing their jobs. According, that's the good news. The bad news is that if Congress does nothing, this funding will expire on September 30th of this year, making a very bad situation worse. We cannot afford to allow that to happen. We need to renew that vital funding. Uh, but let us be clear, that is not all we need to do. We need a vision for all those that the family values. We need a vision for the future, which understands that every family in America has the right to high quality, affordable childcare, that childcare workers deserve decent pay for the important work that they do, and that we must expand the number of childcare programs available so that anybody in America can get the quality care they need. So I look forward to working with all of my colleagues on this committee to make that a reality. And with that, let me recognize Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Child care, obviously, is too expensive for those who need it. But I think it's important to note that it's become more expensive as we've pumped more federal dollars into it. Kind of odd. You know, I'm a doctor. It always says in healthcare, as a doctor, don't just do something, think. We could throw a lot more money at it and see what happens. Why don't we sit and think? Um, and I will point out that we can agree that child care is important for working families, but what, we, but what Republicans will disagree with, at least this Republican, is that more government and more of the kind of spending that congressional Democrats are promoting is the solution. So let's think about that. And I will note that after failing to convince Americans that their child care overhaul and the Build Back Better plan was a good idea, Democrats are promoting additional federal dollars under the guise of a crisis. A crisis. We'll talk about that. This committee does oversee, by the way, right now, the Child Care and Development Block Grant, which is the primary federal program providing child care assistance to low-income working families through a voucher program which retains parental choice. My Democratic colleagues are proposing to completely overhaul this block grant program and create a government-run child care system. And this is despite a 2022, like last year, report by the Bipartisan Policy Center that found that 57% of parents preferred informal child care over formal child care centers, even if the formal care was free and conveniently located. So a one-size-fits-all model of institutional child care with massive sp federal spending doesn't seem to match what parents want or what working families need. I'll also note, by the way, the irony is not lost on anyone that we, are away, that we are days away from the federal government theoretically defaulting on its debt, and we're discussing, among other things, an additional $600 billion to spend on a government-run institutionalized child care system. So let's think about this. Now, by the way, we spoke of a crisis. The plan comes in response to a crisis of its own making as Democrats flooded the child care industry with $39 billion in what was supposed to be short-term COVID-19 spending. There is $18 billion that have still not been spent. The Department of Health and Human Services had to grant nine states four territories, and 82 tribes waivers going back to 2019 because they haven't been able to spend their money on time. I'd also like to point out that HHS, the Government Accountability Office, which is our official sources of information, cannot tell us how the child care funding is being used. And anecdotally, there are stories of the money not being used well. For example, I've heard that it's not been used in the direct operation of running a child care center, um, but on ancillary issues which are quite peripheral to actually providing child care. And I look forward to hearing from HHS and GEO about what they found. And we need this information. We could say, oh my gosh, let's spend a whole lot more money. There's a crisis. Oh, we've got to do something. It's very emotional. But we don't know how the money is. And there's $18 billion out there. And we don't, know how, we don't know how the money that has been spent has been spent. We should have this information to understand the scope and to make an informed decision about potential legisla legislation. It kind of blows my mind that we would dramatically increase funding without knowing how the existing funding is being spent. Just think about that. 
18 billion left to be spent. We're going to dramatically increase funding, and we don't know how the money that we've already put out there has been spent. Now, keep in mind that the massive unchecked spending is how this crisis was created. And now we're told that the crisis can only be solved with even more massive federal takeover policy and funding, in some cases removing parental choice. Now, if there's one thing we learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, parents want to be involved. This committee should make it easier for Americans to pick the best child care option for their family, not financially coerce them into a federal government-run institution. And by the way, we've seen this with, we've seen this movie before. As federal, for example, student loans. As more federal assistance went towards student loans, the cost of student of higher education skyrocketed. Um, and now we're to the point where we've got to forgive a lot of student loans because I could keep going, but you know what my point is. And I'll also point out that as, um, as pointed out by a man named Matthew Desmond in his book, Evicted, poverty and profit in the American city, when the federal government threw additional money at housing programs, the funding was largely swallowed up by a bureaucracy in charge rather than actually meeting those with um, uh, those in need on the ground. I'll point out, Mr. Desmond, I'm sure would self-identify as a liberal. Uh, he is writing about a need to further address poverty. There's nothing in here that would suggest he's a conservative. There's a lot in there to say that he's looked at how we spent money and it grows a bureaucracy and it doesn't meet the needs of those on the ground. Let's just not do something, let's think. Now, when we speak about making childcare affordable through federal assistance, we have to make sure that we are not worsening the very problem we wish to solve or, or fueling an ever-exploding cost that gets transferred onto the backs of taxpayers. And by the way, it's worth repeating, there are still billions of unspent dollars to address child care through the end of next fiscal year. I'll point out this is an incredibly important issue. But there's billions to address it through the end of the next fiscal year. And we're having this hearing when there are nine different health care reauthorizations, health care, health care reauthorizations waiting before this committee that will expire in September if we do not address them. To be, to be more specific, the committee has not formally considered bipartisan text, let alone marked up any of them. If these are not addressed before August recess, that means we'll have less, which means we have less than two months to do nine author, reauthorizations, it will not happen. And this is a basic responsibility of the committee, and the lack of progress towards accomplishing this basic responsibility is concerning. Now, child care is an incredibly important issue, but we have nine crucial health care reauthorizations set to expire in September. Hopefully the June calendar for this committee will prioritize getting those done. Let me finish. I thank the witnesses for being here. They care deeply about affordable child care. Um, what the American people need to know is why this is going to be different than all the other patterns like higher education and health care and other areas where increased federal spending has done little to improve quality or cost and in many instances has done the opposite. We want affordable child care. We don't want more bureaucracy and more government spending that is wasted. Uh, with that, I yield. Uh, let me now uh, turn to Senator Lujan who will introduce our first witness, who is Secretary Elizabeth Groginski uh, of New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our ranking member for holding today's hearing, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. As a Head Start alumnus, I know the value of a high-quality early childhood education and believe that Congress should be strengthening its support for child care in this country, not taking steps backward. It might surprise you there's only two sitting U.S. Senators that went to Head Start. I'm proud to be one of them. I'm incredibly grateful to welcome our Secretary, Elizabeth Grudzinski, and uh, who is our Cabinet Secretary for the Early Childhood Education um, Department from New Mexico. Now, just four years ago, a report came out from the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which is an annual report called Kids Count, um, measuring student well-being and success across the country. Um, we're very thankful in our state that our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, stepped forward and she init initiated um, something that was important for us back in New Mexico. And I think an example um, across the country where we're now one of a few states, including Alabama, Connecticut, Georgia, Massachusetts, and Washington to do this. 
And what our governor did was she created a new cabinet secretary position and a new state agency in 2019 to put programs of children zero to five under one roof. Secretary Grojinski answered the call. And she is our first cabinet secretary for early childhood education in this capacity in helping families and helping children in New Mexico. Now, thanks to the flexibility baked into the federal child care assistance and the amount provided, New Mexico was able to make significant steps in uh, improving and helping children, um, but improving the system that we have in our state. Secretary Grojinski is here to share her story of how transformational these one-time investments were, but also to emphasize that they are worth sustaining. It's critical for Congress to look at what worked with the pandemic, um, with this investment, um, helping kids, and, and how it made a difference in people's lives, and for the committee to come together to restart the bipartisan conversations as well. So I want to thank and welcome our secretary, and I want to say thank you for being here to help share your story. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Grinsky, the floor is yours. Thank you, Senator Lujan. Good morning, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify about New Mexico's success towards building a high quality, equitable, and affordable early childhood system that supports families' needs by delivering early education and care for young children during their years of most critical and rapid development. As an aunt of 18 beautiful nieces and nephews, a great aunt of 19, and in my role as cabinet secretary, I know firsthand the struggles and joys of working families and childcare providers. Today I will discuss how New Mexico transformed childcare to support families, improve children's short and long-term outcomes, and increased and strengthened the childcare workforce that cares for and educates them. These actions taken together ultimately fuels the economy today and into the future. Our state has a unique historical context, diverse cultures and languages with families and traditions going back many hundreds of years. We are shaped by 23 sovereign tribes, pueblos, and nations, which comprise 11% of our population and a 49% Hispanic population, a great diversity which contributes to the depth and the beauty of our state. Despite these strengths, New Mexico has struggled for generations to realize its potential. The reasons for this are complex, many rooted in historical inequities. Under the leadership of our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, New Mexico has pursued a bold transformational vision. Like every other state, New Mexico's childcare industry was on the brink of collapse during the early months of the pandemic. Providers' enrollment and revenues plummeted, exacerbating challenges in recruiting and retaining staff. Fortunately, the federal government recognized that childcare is crucial to families and local economies and made historic investments in the industry. Amidst this crisis, New Mexico identified an opportunity with these federal funds to stabilize and remake the foundation of the state's childcare industry. Critical to the success of this federal funding was its flexibility. Because of this flexibility, New Mexico could be nimble and creative with these funds and preserve the mixed delivery system that gives families the choices they want and need. With this support, the state established groundbreaking initiatives and policy changes. First, we stabilized the industry to ensure access to high quality education. New Mexico's low point in childcare capacity came in February 2021, when 15% of pre-pandemic capacity had been eliminated. We acted swiftly distributing over $163 million in federally funded grants to more than 1,000 child care providers, allowing more programs to reopen and stay open. Providers reported that these stabilization grants saved their businesses and allowed them to emerge from the pandemic even stronger than before. Second, we improved the long-term viability of the workforce and supported parent choice through child care assistance rates that reflect the true cost of care. New Mexico became the first state in the nation, along with D.C., to use a federally approved alternative cost model to inform and determine subsidy rates. Most states use a traditional market rate study, which sets rates based on what providers are charging parents. This method is flawed because child care tuition remains artificially low due to families' inability to afford the full cost of quality care. Tuition stays low to keep families from being priced out, so provider revenues and wages remain low. New Mexico's cost model approach allows child care providers to increase their employees' compensation, have a healthier business bottom line, and we can serve more children. Third, New Mexico strengthened families by significantly expanding eligibility and waiving parent co-payments. The state increased our income eligibility to 40 400% of the federal poverty level and waived all family co-payments. This has been a game changer for working families who routinely spent a third of their income on childcare. Relieved of this crippling financial burden, working families can now better afford rent, mortgage, food, transportation, health care, and other activities that improve their family's stability, security, and well-being. 
Fourth, the state expanded child care supply and access. Like most states, New Mexico has a longstanding shortage of child care supply. To address this, the state allocated over 11 million in ARPA stabilization administration funds to 37 grantees with a capacity, increasing capacity by 1,200. Finally, we advanced a diverse, well-compensated and credentialed early childhood workforce. We used the relief funds to give a $1,500 recruitment bonus, $3 an hour raises. We've also invested in free college supports for advanced credentials. In closing, public investment and leadership makes a difference. The relief funds equipped our state to transform our child care industry. Today, New Mexico leads the nation in early childhood investment and innovation and is a roadmap for other states looking to make similar changes. However, continued federal investment is necessary to maintain the transformational gains in states. New Mexico is proof of the enormous impact that a significant federal investment can have on children, families, and their communities. An investment in quality childcare is an investment in a more vibrant and secure future for our country. Learning from the extraordinary federal early childhood investments made during the pandemic, I urge the members of this committee, Congress, and the federal administration to maintain these investments and commit to a long-term state funding strategy that sustains the significant advancements we and others have made. Thank you for your time and this opportunity to share New Mexico's experience and vision for the future of our children. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Luginski. Uh, our next witness will be Lauren Hogan, who is the Managing Director of Policy and Professional Advancement at the National Association for the Education of Young Children. She is a national policy expert on child care and early learning. Uh, Ms. Hogan, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you so much, Senator Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee. It's a privilege to be here today as a parent and on behalf of NAEYC's early childhood community. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share educators' stories, to show how helping them helps families, and to talk with you about how we can solve the crisis at hand. Early childhood educators are the linchpin driving childcare quality and supply for all ages in all settings. Together with families, they help children build strong foundations and their success is proven by decades of evidence attesting to the short and long-term benefits of investing in quality early learning. However, these educators, women and women of color, are earning poverty level wages that undermine their skilled and complex work. Facing limited choices, parents of young children pay more for childcare than college tuition, and a lack of investment in childcare for infants and toddlers alone costs our country $122 billion each year. How does this happen? Childcare is unique a textbook example of a market failure in which neither families nor educators can absorb the true cost. Imagine a deep hole in the ground surrounded by quicksand. Educators and parents are struggling to stand on the edge and build a bridge across the chasm where public funding should be. The educators try by, say, maxing out credit cards like Amanda in California or accessing Social Security early like a family child care provider in Iowa or foregoing salary, like Sheila in Tennessee. Parents are trying too, but as Leah in Washington says, we are barely making it. The start of the pandemic worsens these pre-existing challenges, but amid the crisis, childcare relief funds arrive. And in addition to helping families by limiting co-pays and expanding eligibility, Every state sets up stabilization grant programs that are responsive to community needs, supporting providers so they can support families and children and businesses. You've heard about the amazing work in New Mexico, but we know that 75% of states increase pri provider payment rates. And many, from Kansas to Kentucky, Maine to Michigan, Oklahoma to Ohio, are building the supply and retention of the early childhood workforce. 300,000 new childcare slots are created, and the number of licensed programs today exceeds the number open pre-pandemic, thanks to federal relief. The grants didn't fill the hole, but they stabilized the quicksand around it, and they've been a saving grace for the 220,000 childcare programs and 10 million children and their families. In one NAEYC survey, 92% of childcare programs said the grants helped keep their program open, and 30% would have closed permanently without them. Stabilization grants have been greatly appreciated, says Nicole, a center director in New Jersey, and I pray they will continue. Unfortunately for Nicole and educators everywhere, stabilization grant funding is ending, and parents and educators feel themselves sinking back into this quicksand. 
So director in Louisiana says, after the end of stabilization grants, the increase in pay will need to be passed on to families. We really don't want to do this, but we'll have no choice. Approximately 40% of center directors and family child care providers agree, saying that their programs, too, are going to be forced to raise tuition. One in three leaders say their programs will cut wages. One in five family child care providers will serve fewer children. Only 13% of family child care respondents could say that their program will be fine when stabilization grants end. It's a climate of extreme uncertainty for these small businesses. Educators are walking away. Parents and providers are desperate. A center director in Tennessee that she said that she's hiring people now that she never would have interviewed before the pandemic. This is the kind of last resort decision that should really worry us all. Parents and providers feel like they're failing, but it's the market that's failing them. Correcting underlying imbalances requires government intervention, not to restrict individual choices, but to enhance them. Congress must recognize that childcare is a public good that requires public investment and step in with subsidized funding at sufficient scope and scale as it does with other industries when free markets fail. Building on bipartisan support and with the knowledge that good things happen when Congress funds childcare and early learning, we urge you to prioritize the investments needed to keep the quicksand stabilized and fill the hole. Support every state with sufficient and predictable funding and flexibility that allows them to finance the true cost of care. Invest in the education and compensation of educators, make childcare more affordable for families, and support infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and school age children in a comprehensive mixed delivery system that provides for real family choice. The hole is deep, the quicksand is strong, and parents and educators can't build the bridge alone. Thankfully, we know federal investments in child care work, and so Congress must make them before it's too late. Thank you very much. Ms. Hogan, thank you very much. Uh, let me now turn to Senator Kane, who will uh, introduce our next witness, Cheryl Mormon. Well, to my colleagues, I'm really honored to have the chance to introduce you to Mrs. Cheryl Mormon, um, and she plays an important role in this panel because she represents home health, home child care providers, family child care providers. Uh, Ms. Mormon is the current president of the Virginia Alliance for Family Child Care Associations. It's the only statewide association in Virginia solely focused on home-based family child care and is an affiliate of the National Association for Family Child Care. Um, Ms. Mormon has owned and operated a family child care program, Blessings from Above, in my hometown of Richmond for over 20 years. Um, Blessings from Above stayed open throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, serving children of first responders, teachers, and other essential professions. And this is an important one. Mrs. Mormon personally called over 400 family child care providers during COVID within the Commonwealth to ensure that they knew how to access the child care stabilization grants. She represents publicly funded family child care providers on the Virginia Early Childhood Advisory Committee. She works with the Virginia Department of Education in tandem with Virginia Commonwealth University to develop a unified set of early learning and development standards for children's age birth to five. She's a member of a working group by the Virginia Department of Social Services to build, to build child care supply in underserved areas using a toolkit for community services. I'm grateful for the work that she does. I'm grateful that she's with us today. Thank you for all you do, Mrs. Mormon. Uh, Ms. Mormon, you're recognized. Good morning, Chair Sanders. Hold that mic a little bit closer to your mouth, please. Good morning, Chair Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity. I am Cheryl Mormon, President of the Virginia Alliance of Family Child Care Association, the only state association in Virginia whose focus is family child care which refers to small child care programs operated from someone's home. I have been licensed family child care business owner and educator since 2002. The children in my care are six weeks to five years of age. I am a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. Since testimony this morning is short, I will get to the topic at hand, the child care crisis and the role of the federal government in improving this crisis. Prior to COVID-19, my family child care business was at capacity with a waiting list. I had two full-time teachers along with myself, 11 families paid privately, 
and the only one of my families participated in the child care subsidy program. I was able to maintain payroll and my expenses. There were parents that would have difficulty from time to time, but they made too much money to qualify for assistance. I would have to work out payment arrangements, often to my business's detriment, to continue to meet the needs of our families and the children entrusted in my care. Then COVID-19 hit. Many daycare facilities began to close. However, many family child care facilities continued to operate. The funding provided by Congress for COVID-19 relief, particularly $50 billion since December 2020, helped me to stabilize and get through without sacrificing critical services to the parents I serve. To help families with the cost of childcare, the federal funding allowed the state to increase the income eligibility and do away with their copay, which meant more families could qualify for childcare assistance. The number of families in my program benefiting from child care assistance increased from one to six. Some were new families and some were families I cared for before that, now qualified for child care assistance. Eventually, the state also increased the number of absences covered, providing resources based on enrollment and not attendance. This meant that if a family um, had COVID or was exposed to COVID, had to be out for seven to 10 days prior to the provider, still receive tuition and child remain with the program. Other crucial assistance received included four rounds of CARES grants, 25,000 in American Rescue Plan stabilization funds, a payment protection plan loan, unemployment insurance, and COBRA coverage when my husband lost his job after almost 30 years with the same company, and finally, a small business administration loan of 46,000. This loan was needed to keep my program doors open and a roof over our head, since regardless of all the help, operational expenses increased dramatically. My life during the COVID-19 pandemic was about survival. In a lot of ways, it still is. I want to reiterate that the relief funding was critical to saving the childcare industry, and more specifically, my own business. I believe more providers would have closed if Congress did not act significantly and swiftly. But systemic challenges persist. For example, I have vacant slots I cannot fill without an additional staff person. I recently interviewed a young woman who was well qualified, but as I shared the pay, she declined. Virginia recently piloted a new solution to address the child care staff crisis. They will attract and train new people to work in child care programs if we agree to pay $17 an hour for one year. This is a great step, but I currently pay $12 an hour and cannot afford this increase. Good policy solutions without additional sustained funding will not work. I want to pay more since my staff deserve more, but I want to stress that I will go out of business without additional sustained funding. Furthermore, I hear from many family child care providers who are dis disproportionately women of color that they are close to closing and leaving child care altogether. According to a recent report by NAFCC and NAEYC, 40% of respondents from family child care homes reported that they are considering leaving their program or closing their family child care home, primarily due to the low compensation and funding. We must invest in laying a firm foundation for all children, not just the ones from wealthy families. Families need different options, which are not available without additional sustained funding. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn the mic over to Senator Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair Sanders. We're joined today by Ms. Carrie Lucas, uh, President of the Independent Women's Forum. Ms. Lucas joins us as a policy expert, advocate, and mother of five kids, a graduate of Princeton and of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Ms. Lucas can speak to what parents want and need, the appropriate role of the federal government in helping to address child care issues, and her experience as a working mom. We look forward to her testimony on the choices, um, on, on the choices, uh, why, ch why, why child care should not operate like a K through 12 public school, and what the evidence says about government-run institutional child care's impact on children. We welcome Ms. Lucas and look forward to her testimony. Thank you very much. 
Um, good morning, I'm Carrie Lucas and I'm president of Independent Women's Forum. Independent Women's Forum is a nonprofit organization dedicated to developing and advancing policies that aren't just well intended, but that actually enhance people's freedoms, opportunities, and well-being. Um, I am a mother of five children between ages eight and 17. Um, and as you consider policies designed to help parents of young children, I urge you to keep the following principles in mind. First, American families want choices, not a one-size-fits-all government daycare regime. The premise of today's hearing is that there is a crisis making sweeping intervention necessary, yet reality is different. Many parents absolutely do face significant challenges related to, to accessing and affording childcare, but there are many that are also satisfied with their arra existing arrangements. In fact, a 2021 bipartisan public policy center survey found that two-thirds two of single parent and two um, two working parent households were using what they considered their ideal child care arrangement. That's important because while policymakers should seek to help those in need, we also don't want to disrupt those, um, uh, the situation for those who, for whom their situation is working. Critically, surveys also suggest that most parents do not perform formal daycare settings. A 2022 report of the Bipartisan Policy Center found that nearly six in 10 parents preferred informal childcare over formal childcare centers, and that's even if formal, formal childcare was free and in a convenient location. Most parents in Americans simply think that having family or family-like care is best for children. Now, secondly, don't make childcare and preschools operate like our K through 12 public school system. You know, at the height of the COVID pandemic, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, about 60% of childcare centers um, were closed. But by the end of 2020, to, uh, at the end of 2020, an estimated 73% of childcare centers had opened. In contrast, at the end of 2020, only about one third of K through 12 public schools were providing fully in-person services. The private schools had largely opened, but most public schools fought to stay closed for as long as possible. And public schools behave this way because they do not see parents and students as their customers. And why would they? Their ability to pay the bills and keep their jobs depends on pleasing government officials, not on serving families. And in fact, we should be warned that all the battles we see over public K through 12s today, over curriculums, the use of pronouns, sex ed, masking policies, they will come to your local daycare and preschool if government becomes the primary funder and sets the rules for what constitutes an approved daycare provider. Parents should fight to keep this from becoming the situation for our child care and preschools. Thirdly, government officials can and should perform, per, um, pursue reforms to make daycare more affordable and accessible. And to start, policymakers at all level of government should seek to eliminate regulations that are not directly related to safety and true quality. You know, a study by the, by the Mercatus Center found that cost of care could be reduced by as much as $1,900 per child per year by eliminating regulations not directly related to quality of care. And during COVID, policy leaders around the country, Democrats as well as Republicans, did lift daycare regulations to encourage the creation of additional di um, daycare options. Policymakers should explore the consequences of this deregulation and continue to eliminate regulations that don't make sense. Next, financially support families, not daycare providers, and use the money wisely. Um, you know, rather than shoveling more taxpayer money into government bureaucracies, policymakers ought to provide tax relief for parents or direct support to parents so they can make the choices that make sense for them. Importantly, policymakers should not make financial support conditional on child care arrange arrangements. Incentivizing the use of paid child care isn't fair to the families who have loved ones, parents, grandparents, aunts, and neighbors who provide loving care for children in their lives for free while foregoing paid employment. Having family members like grandparents as caregivers is good for kids as well as their grandparents. We should not effectively discourage or crowd out these relationships by incentivizing only paid child care. And finally, government approved daycare isn't necessarily good for kids. Your government funding for child care is often sold as a surefire way to improve life outcomes for children, particularly from low income families. However, the evidence simply doesn't bear this out. Congressionally mandated studies of Head Start have failed to show lasting benefits for participants. A recent study in Tennessee of the state-run pre-K revealed it had long-term negative effects on children's achievement and behavior. This doesn't mean that there's no studies that will find benefits associated with preschool, nor does it mean that 
that daycare and childcare are a necessary and important service for millions of children and families. But it should encourage some humility and caution policymakers away from trying to push all students into government approved childcare centers, since that could do more harm than good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Lucas. Uh, Senator Cassidy. I'm sorry. Uh, we also welcome um, Ms. Kathy Laren, Laren uh, Director of the Government Accounting Office's Education, Workforce, and Income Security Team. Ms. Laren oversees GAO's work on a variety of issues impacting low-income and vulnerable populations, including child care, child welfare, and economic assistance programs. Today, Ms. Laren will speak to what the data shows about how states use supplemental child care funding and how complete data on the way states use the funding will not be available for another few years. Her testimony will detail the challenges states experience managing more federal funding than they'd ever received and difficulties getting money to providers quickly. We look forward to Ms. Laren's testimony about what we can say definitively about how states use their supplemental pandemic child care funding. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss GAO's work on state's use of COVID-19 pandemic-related funding for child care. The federal government has long invested in child care as a key support for workers to help them become self-sufficient. During the pandemic, Congress appropriated more than $52 billion in supplemental funding, including to the Child Care and Development Fund, the nation's key federal program for subsidizing child care. This was to help stabilize the sector and ensure that some families would have access to child care. My testimony today will address two items, how states used pandemic relief child care funds and flexibilities, and past and continuing challenges states face in spending these funds. First, regarding state spending of supplemental funds, as of April 2023, states had spent approximately $34.5 billion of the $52.5 billion in supplemental funding that Congress appropriated. The majority of the unspent funds, $11.7 billion, were provided through the American Rescue Plan, and states have until September 2024 to spend them. The rest must be spent by the end of this fiscal year, September 2023. According to a survey that we conducted in 2020 and interviews we've had with state officials since then, states used supplemental funds for various purposes, including to provide childcare to essential workers and to support childcare centers experiencing temporary closures and decreased enrollment. States have also taken advantage of new flexibilities offered through this supplemental funding. For example, by changing the way they pay providers or by waiving or reducing family co-payments. And there's some evidence that the funds have helped accomplish what they were meant to do, stabilize the childcare industry. More generous absence stay policies and paying providers based on enrollment rather than attendance kept some providers open when enrollment was low or fluctuating. More providers joined state programs, providing them with a reliable source of income during volatile times and allowing them to stay open. And after an initial steep decline, employment in the child care sector has steadily increased, though it has not yet rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. However, given the time states have to spend the remaining funds and significant lags in reporting of data, a full accounting of how all the pandemic funds are being spent will likely not be available until 2025 or 2026. Turning now to challenges states face in spending the funds. We interviewed child, state child care officials in seven states in the fall of 2022, and they said they faced both short-term and long-term challenges adapting their subsidy programs to use the supplemental funding, in some cases before federal guidance was available. All seven states told us they faced challenges moving quickly after receiving the money. They were tasked with managing and distributing the very large increase in funding during a compressed time frame, and some states found it challenging to find ways to best meet families and providers' needs. 
In addition, states told us they had to think strategically about to how to manage funds given their time-limited nature. Some states sought to spend money on one-time items rather than addressing long-standing challenges. For example, investing in IT systems or training or offering one-time signing bonuses to new employees rather than raising staffed wages or substantially expanding enrollment. Other states implemented changes that they would like to sustain, but they expressed uncertainty about future funding levels and the impact on their programs of reverting to pre-pandemic eligibility and provider payment policies. Some anticipate that having to expel families from the program when the funding expires. In sum, the supplemental child care funding provided to the Child Care Development Fund and stabilization grants during the pandemic provided critical support to both providers and families in need of care. But a full accounting of the funds, how they're being used, and their full impact will not be available for at least the next few years. This concludes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin the questioning. Um, let me start off with Mr. Greg Grinsky, and I don't have a lot of time, so please answer briefly. New Mexico is not the most progressive state in the country. It's not the most conservative state in the country. You have kind of revolutionized the way you do childcare in that state. How do the people in New Mexico feel about it? Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Chairman Sanders. Talking to the mic, please. Thank you. Um, they are thrilled. I traveled the state. I talked to families. I talked to providers. I talked to educators. Everybody feels more valued and respected. So what the governor has done and what you have done is popular in the state. People feel good about it. Absolutely. All right, Ms. Hogan, let me ask you. Um, you're an expert on children in this country. First thought, how do we compare in terms of our child care with other countries? And second of all, in your judgment, given the fact that psychologists tell us zero through four is the most important years of intellectual and emotional development, how do we treat our kids in general? Thank you for the question. I think it's really important to know that the U.S. does not stack up well compared to what other countries have chosen to do, given, interestingly, research and information that they base on what's happened in the U.S. They know from what we've done the promise that exists in early childhood education and learning, and they've taken that and made the investments that are necessary across child care, of course, but also paid leave and the other ways in which we're able to invest in the supports for children and families that are needed. Okay. Ms. Mormon, you, we, we've heard a lot of discussion today. You've made one simple fact, with, I think, which I think tells us all, uh, as much as we need to know. You mentioned that you are paying workers at your facility, which I gather is not a government-run, one-size-fit-all. It's a little, small, private operation that you have. What, 11 families? Uh, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you mentioned you pay workers in Virginia $12 an hour. Yes, sir. And I know that you do it, that's the best that you can do. You're struggling to stay in existence. I mean, just in general, and, and I applaud you for maintaining your facility and providing childcare, but would you agree that we have to, as a nation, do better than pay people less than what they make in McDonald's or almost any other profession out there? Yes, sir, I would. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, I'm enrolled in the Virginia Child Care Subsidy Program, but I have vacant slots that I cannot fill because I need to hire additional, an additional staff person. I recently interviewed, as I stated, the young lady, and I shared the pay, and she declined. So hiring an additional person would have given us the ability to care for more children and be more flexible with the hours. Currently, as it stands, if either of us, meaning my other staff person, if we are sick or have a family emergency, then I must either close my facility for that time period or reimburse parents for the day if they are unable to find alternate care for the day that was not a scheduled um, day in advance. Thank you. Uh, let me get back uh, to uh, Madam Secretary here. Um, what have you been able to do to raise pay in New Mexico and uh, attract more qualified uh, workforce? Thank you, Chairman. The, uh, um, what we've been able to do is we raised everybody's wages $3 an hour who worked in childcare. Providers opted in if they wanted to do that. We've also set our childcare reimbursement rates at the true cost of care using the cost estimation model. 
providers are able to attract and pay people now $16 an hour, $17 an hour, and we're valuing and respecting, again, families and educators. And families have more choice. Families now have more choice, both because they have, we have family child care, we have faith-based, we have language immersion programs. See, the idea of one size fits all is not what you're doing exactly. in New Mexico. No. It's, and it's, they're all private businesses, nonprofit, for-profit, faith-based. Uh, there's lots of options for families, and it's important that we invest in all of those options. Ms. Hogan, if in Vermont it costs $15,000 a year, what impact does that have on the financial well-being of families? Can families afford, in many cases, middle-class, working-class families afford child care? Vermont's actually doing really great work to address a comprehensively early childhood education, but you know, the reality is that families can't, I mean, as we know, families cannot afford it. The problem is that we at policymakers ask parents to cover this cost of care out of their own pockets. And we ask educators to subsidize the cost through their own low wages. And that's because of the way the market is structured, it doesn't work because the benefits go so far beyond each individual and family. All right, let me interrupt you and just ask you my last question here. Why is childcare so expensive? It's a great question because it's something that every parent with kids in or looking for childcare asks. And the reality is that it does require a little bit of an understanding about the market. It is a labor intensive market and it should be. Like this is about driving safety and consistency and quality. Programs regularly spend up to 85% of costs on personnel to have these in place. But it's important to remember, I think, that the goal no, is- In other words, you don't have one worker for 30 or 40 kids. No. And you have to have those in place in order for safety and for driving quality. And we can talk more about some of those pieces. Okay. Uh, Senator Cassidy. I shall defer to Senator Tuberville. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here. Uh, you know, child care is important. You know, it's a personal decision for working families. Been there, done that. Most of us have. And it is expensive. Uh, but we got real problems by the way the federal government funds our child care program. Now, Pretty interesting to me we're doing this right now when we are having problems with our debt, okay? But that being said, uh, we must remember that child care is run by the states, not the federal government. And that's the way it should be. But if my colleagues here get their way, child care facilities would only be eligible for all this new money only if they play by federal rules. Do we want that? We got to Really think about that. That means that the federal government uh, will control the curriculum, uh, require child care workers to have a four-year degree, price out the middle class. Ms. Lucas, would imposing a four-year degree requirement on child care, child care employees, what would it do to the labor market? Well, I, th I think we've seen that in um, in Washington, D.C., where they've um, moved in the direction of rec making these requirements, and it would obviously make it much more expensive. Um, and as a parent, I think it is uh, misguided, because as we all know, when you're looking for care for, um, for especially your youngest kids, what you're really focused on is having somebody who is loving, caring, patient, um, and having a, a four-year degree um, is certainly um, you know, not a necessary requ requirement in that and does needlessly push up costs. Thank you. Uh what would it do to our religious providers and our private providers? You know, I do think that that's something we should be um, concerned about. Um, and I think it's great when you have um, state-based programs that are, um, you know, basically providing fa families with vouchers um, so they can make those choices. But, you know, more than half of our, my understanding is a little more than half of all daycare slots are um, are faith-based. And we need to make sure of that. I worry when it was looking, when I was looking at the proposals for Build Back Better and the child care provisions in there, um, that it could, that there was a threat that there could be, you um, things that would be inconsistent with faith-based care. And I think that that's something we should all make sure is absolutely protected, because that is really important. The environment, um, parents want to be able to have an environment that they think is supportive of their children. Ms. Lauren, do you have anything to add to that about faith-based? Not really? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, so essentially, we'd be putting our children in public schools from three years old and up. 
is that is that what we're talking about here? You know, I worry about that. I do think that that sometimes the the model, if we um, if we focus on a model like expanding K through 12 education, um, that, that could be really problematic. And I do think COVID um, showed us some of the problems. And it wasn't just you know we fought, had a lot of conversations about curriculum policies, um, but also things like um, like just staying open or masking policies. I think it's worth noting. You know, people haven't talked much about Head Start, um, and that is the you know the federal government spends um, more than 10 billion dollars. That's about $10,000 a year, but Head Start has a lot of problems. It's got um, waste fraud and abuse problems. Um, it's very inex it's very expensive per hour. It provides less hours per care than, than most other providers. And then you know, Head Start kids were among those who are forced to wear masks longer than just about anybody else, um, long after we'd realized that you know, adults have been able to take their masks off and we were learning that masks were not just not doing any good for kids in schools, but they were actually harming them. So I worry about, about kind of um, some of these uh, providers or these institutions becoming political footballs. Ms. Lauren, what would spending this kind of money do to our financial system? That's a little bit easier question. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? What would spending this type of kind of money, all this money, what would it do to our financial system? Yeah, I can't, I can't answer the question about the financial system, I'm sorry. Um, but what I can say is that historically, we have invested about eight to ten billion dollars a year in childcare, and the fifty-two point five billion dollars that was appropriated during the pandemic was really unprecedented, um, and that is part of the reason that states face challenges in spending that money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for this hearing. I wanted to start with. Um, Elizabeth Graginski, and ask about uh, the, your experience in New Mexico. And as a kind of a, a predicate for the question, I represent a state that has 67 counties in Pennsylvania, but 48 are rural counties. And um, these childcare challenges that we've heard so much about today and have heard for a long time um, were persistent throughout every county in the state, no matter what no matter what um, the population base of the county. The child care stabilization grants, which came through the American Rescue Plan, were used by every type of child care provider. And our state received a little less than $729 million. Um, that, re that represents um, more than 6,800 child care programs that affected uh, 365,500 children in our state. So a huge impact uh, that that one initiative provided to the American Rescue Plan. And we know that um, the, the, the shortage uh, that we've talked about is particularly severe for uh, children with disabilities and, and families that live in those rural areas. So how have these stabilization grants been used to support child care providers in rural areas. That's the first part of the question. The second is, uh, what is at stake for these communities uh, mm -hmm. when the funding ends uh, in September? Thank you, Senator Casey. Um, we were able to distribute almost, as I said, $168 million. Much of New Mexico is also very rural. And in addition to the stabilization grants, it, as I said, it's not only stabilized, but strengthened so many of the family child care center-based, programs all over the state, and we have been able to use the uh, administrative dollars from stabilization to build supply. A small village of Des Moines, we're working with the mayor uh, and people in his community to build childcare. So it's absolutely critical that we not only continue to make investments in childcare, but we look at ways to build the brick and mortar, uh, the capacity in rural communities and all across our states uh, to make more child care more available, and again, to this issue of parent choice, that's what's going to th make it thrive. This, these are all voluntary programs. <coughs> Families are coming to us saying, help us, and we're saying family child care, center-based care, in-home care, grandparents, we can help people build their own child care businesses. So it's been a big, a big help, and we need to continue those investments. Well, thanks, and I, I'm just um, astounded at, at the, the fundamental nature of these investments for these centers in our state. We're told that um, just in Pennsylvania, the, uh, just for child care centers, 
uh, they were receiving a little more than $142,000 per center. And here's what they're using it for, uh, personnel costs, so fundamental in the pandemic and, and throughout the last couple of years. Um, using the, the dollars for, uh, for rent and mortgage, and that sometimes applied more to the family care centers, uh, of which we have uh, thousands in our state. So it's critically important that we have a response. We can't just throw up our hands and say, well, the funding's uh, over, and your, your, uh, Washington has no response to that at all. We've got to have a response. In the remaining time I have, Ms. Hogan, I was going to ask you about um, legislation. I may be preempting Senator Murray because she's the lead on this bill, but the Child Care for Working Families Act, um, I've, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to be a co-lead on that legislation led by Senator Murray. And I wanted to ask you, how would that legislation provide a comprehensive solution to child care needs, uh, including by lowering costs for families, increasing access to care, and addressing early educator workforce shortages? Senator Casey, thank you so much for the question because it really is this responsive, comprehensive strategy. And there's just a couple of things I would raise because it addresses the entire system and it does sort of really center this federal state partnership. And I think that's one of the things that we talk about when we talk about the importance of centering good things that happen at states. We know from relief funding, um, it recognizes and pays for the true cost of care, which we've talked about as being incredibly important to balancing all these pieces. Caps costs for working families and ensures the lowest family has free, expands childcare and pre-K and Head Start. And it provides grants, which again, as we know, they work to improve quality and, and supply. Thanks very much. It's okay to repeat that if, if Senator Murray asks you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Mark Wayne Mullen. Thank you, uh, Senator, and um, thank you for our panelists for being here. I, I'm going to address a question real quick about why is it so expensive. Fourteen years ago, my wife and I uh, wanted to provide health care for, for our employees. It was actually going to be a benefit because we were having a lot of employees miss work because they couldn't find child health care. So we went through the process of trying to set it up, and it was crazy how expensive it was. Then outside of that, the liability that it brought to our company honestly outweighed the benefit of it. Because of how much regulations that we pour on these, on these early child development centers, preschool, it makes it almost cost prohibitive. And so if we really want to fix cost, we should start looking at ourselves and seeing out a way that we can soften the amount of regulations and still keep our kids safe. Now, let me get to the, to, to the point of my, my questions and kind of make a point here. When we're trying to federalize our education system. To me, it sounds like we're trying to move more towards socialism. Because when you federalize an education system, you're standardizing what you're going to be teaching our kids and taking the parents out of the ability to have a say in it. And, and so I have, very, I have a lot of concerns about this, and it still baffles me that the chairman of our committee, Health Education, I'm going to put, right, put that big, Health Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, is a, that was appointed by our Senate Democrats is a self-proclaimed socialist. I, I'm not just calling that. Chairman, you, you openly say that you're a socialist. In your book, Outsider uh, in the House, the chairman says, Bill Clinton is a moderate Democrat. I'm a Democrat socialist. That's over our education system. I have a book here in, here in front of me called Our Skin that has been endorsed by NACI. Uh, and I'm going to read exactly what this book says. You guys might find it interesting. A long time ago, way before you were born, a group of white people made up an idea called race. They sorted people by skin color and said that white people were better, smarter, prettier, and they deserve more than everybody else. This would be taught if we socialize our pre-K system. This would be taught. Do you disagree with that findings in the book? A thousand percent. Really? How about we teach Jesus loves me? How about, how about this? In teaching Jesus loves, loves the little children, the lyrics go red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in our sight. Now, which one would you think would be better? I'll ask everybody on the panel. Which is better to teach? This that is a, a story 
that was made up to teach our kids. Three-year-olds who have no idea what race is, now all of a sudden is being taught that white people said this as a truth. Someone pointed me that this being a truth, that white people developed race, that white people developed that, that all of a sudden that was our word that we developed. By the way, I'm Cherokee, Native American. I think we have experienced a little bit of racism before in my life, Chairman. Senator Mullen. So, so I ask everybody on the panel, which one is better to teach? This or the Jesus Loves Me lyrics? Ma'am, I'll start down here. Just tell yeah, me which yeah. one. I don't have time for an explanation. What I'll tell you, Senator Mullen, is that what children um, in these early years no, no, develop no, no. their identity. I didn't question. The, it's the question is, is which it's important one do you that think our is classrooms to, are. I'm just asking which one is better. To Let her answer, answer the question, please. I, the, my question is this. She will which answer one is if better? she sees fit. Which one is better? It's important, this? It's important that children's identity that's and not language my and question. culture are recognized. That's not answering my question. And that's, that's what creates strong that, executive okay, function. Okay, if you don't want to answer my question, that's fine. Let's move on down the panel. Which one is better to be taught? This book or the Jesus Loves Me lyrics that says everybody's, that everybody's skin doesn't matter. They're all precious in his sight. I think it's important to teach that all children are seen and valued for who they are. And that's so, what But when you teach this, don't about. you think that other people are start saying that white kids are to blame? No. I think it's important. It's exactly what they're going to teach. It's exactly what it is, ma'am. I disagree. Um, first, it is important that we teach Jesus. And Absolutely. Jesus is what we teach. So which one is but better? But the reality this, is. So do you think this is Could the Could she answer the question, please? No, I don't want reality. I'm asking the question, which one is better? That is exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Got okay. it on tape. <laughs> misspoke. So uh, what I'm saying is, is which one is which? Which one is better to be taught, Mr. Chairman? Is it this or is it, or is it the Jesus? Is your question directed to me or Ms. Bowman? Well, you keep interrupting me saying they're not asking the question. Want to ask and I the wish question? you really sat on no, the no, question. No, no, no. It's his question. Time. He gets to dictate it. Which not one? Not dictate it. Ask the question. Which one? Talking to Ms. Bowman, right? Yes. As I stated, Jesus is always first. Absolutely. I agree with that. So let me end with this because I still have more time because the chairman kept interrupting me. I'm going to close with two quotes, okay? The first is from John Adams. It says, morality and virtue are the foundation of a republic and necessary for society to be free. The second one is from our socialist communist, Joseph Stalin. That says, education is a weapon whose effect depends on who hands it is in and whom it is aimed. We gotta be careful what we're trying to do here. With that, I yield back. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all of our witnesses for appearing today. Uh, from the high cost of care to persistent and widespread shortages of care, the lack of access to affordable childcare is straining the finances of families in every corner of my state. But I also hear from Wisconsin business owners who report that access to childcare remains a primary barrier to hiring and retaining the employees that they need. I think Wisconsin has done well uh, at using federal investments uh, to connect businesses with childcare needed for their workers. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to share a little bit of that story at today's hearing. However, I am concerned about the ability of families and businesses in Wisconsin to continue to utilize these types of partnerships when the available funding uh, runs out. I'm also really concerned about our ability to provide meaningful investment to address the child care crisis under the constraints of the debt limit deal uh, that is being uh, debated uh, right now in the House and will ultimately uh, come to the Senate. Um, Ms. Hogan, Wisconsin used federal dollars from our COVID-19 response to create an innovative program that helps businesses purchase child care slots for the benefit of their employees. This program, called the Partner Up Program, has also pioneered uh, an innovative true cost of care model, which 
I know has been referred to already, um, that allows participating child care providers to be paid what it actually costs uh, to provide care to children, making it an attractive program for businesses and child care programs alike. But I'm concerned, as I said, when the federal dollars run out, that innovative programs like this, both, both in Wisconsin and nationwide, will end. So tell me, are we at risk right now of losing the momentum of addressing the child care crisis if we fail to make up for this shortfall? What are you seeing? I would say the short answer is yes, though we trust the parents and businesses who really need this investment will continue to push for the investments that are needed. But it's unfortunate that the funding is ending because it is what you describe as such a great example of how a federal, state, business, parent partnership can really work. And there are other examples, your neighbor in Michigan, there's great examples of these pieces coming together to really meet the needs. And it really proves the point of what happens when the federal government makes these investments and states can respond to those needs um, in ways that are responsive to what's happening on the ground. Great. Um, I have a question for you, Ms. Mormon. Uh, uh, as you well know, uh, family child care providers uh, provide indispensable uh, services to families across the country. And I'm concerned uh, about the fact that my state, Wisconsin, lost nearly 25% of its family child care providers in recent years. That's a dramatic uh, drop. I, I've heard from um, Wisconsinites about the initial cost um, to become licensed, that it can be very daunting um, uh, for would-be family care providers. And at the same time, I know that families and, uh, and child care providers share a strong interest that these homes meet uh, rigorous care and safety standards. Startup grants, like those that were included in the Child Care for Working Families Act, really helped family uh, child care providers meet licensing standards and offset these initial costs without sacrificing safety or quality. And in your role as uh, sort of the head of an association of, of in-home uh, family child cares, I, I ask you to talk about the importance of these startup grants. I, I'm trying to uh, think of uh, an example that everyone could relate to. Say you want to get in the business, but um, uh, you don't have a fence around your uh, backyard, and the children are going to be playing out there. That cost of just putting in the fence, which you need for safety, might be daunting in terms of uh, overcoming that and making uh, something work. So tell me a little bit about um, uh, startup grants, um, uh, in addition, of course, to reasonable reimbursement rates to help recruit and retain more family child care providers. Yes, ma'am. More children spend time in home-based child care settings than any other child care setting. Family child care educators disproportionately care for infants and toddlers and children from low-income families, families of color, as well as families living in rural communities. Therefore, it is critical to ensure home-based child care providers have access to higher reimbursement rates and resources to start up their child care programs to meet health, safety, and quality standards. When I started my program, I had to make modifications to my home and purchase furniture and materials for the child care program. I used my savings since I didn't have income from child care yet. Steps to reduce barriers to licensing include providing startup grants and providing technical assistance from trusted advisors and coaches on topics like stages of child development, implementing a curriculum, and running a child care business. Family child care providers also face housing insecurity at an alarming rate. According to a standard rapid survey, over one quarter of home based providers were worried about being evicted from their homes. Ms. Mormon, wow. time has expired. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, I'm glad we're talking about child care here this morning. Um, I don't view child care as a threat to me as a parent um, about uh, whether or not we're, we're, we're losing our, our values. Um, as a parent, I want to know what's going on in my child care facility. I want to know what's going on in my kid's school, and I think that that's incumbent upon me as that parent then to actively engage in that. But I want to have some choices. I want to have some options. 
And in my state right now, 61%, 61% of Alaskans live in what they call a child care desert. They have nothing. So when we're looking for, for workers from everything, from slope workers to teachers to, to doctors, I'm having, I'm having, I'm having workforce issues in other spaces because we don't have access to childcare. The community of Valdez, the terminus of the Alaska, uh, Alaska pipeline, got a great little hospital there. They're trying to get some providers. They got some nurses that are lined up to come, and they find out that the only licensed childcare facility in all of Valdez has closed down, and there's no plan for it. The Coast Guard says, if we don't have child care there in Valdez, we're not so sure about the viability of, of Valdez as a Coast Guard community. Child care is not only a, a workforce issue, it's a military readiness issue. I had a sit down with the head of, of our, child, our, our child care coalitions, um, and I brought in the base commander from Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson because he's telling me that the number one challenge he's got right now when it comes to, to readiness is the availability of, of child care. And we talked about is it, is it what child care providers are being paid? And we found out that in the military, at least, at least on JBEAR, they've got flexibility to pay their child care providers more and they still can't get the people that they needed. And I asked a simple question, what more can we do? If it's not the pay, what is it? And I was told, until you, until you allow child care providers to think that this is a career and not just a job where I'm going to go get minimum wage, and then hopefully I'm going to get something better from there. Our, our reality is child care is an imperative in so many of our communities, our states, and, and, and we've got to do more to address it. Um, this weekend in our, in our state's largest newspaper article about child care in Alaska, 250 people on the wait list in a facility in Palmer uh, at the child care facility just up the road from, um, from where I used to live there in Anchorage. What, what children, what families are being charged for one kid, $1,700. You tell me, you tell me how a family who's a teacher and a firefighter, is, is finding $1,700 for their one kid. So it's not only child care deserts, it's the issue of, of affordability. I'm told that on average in Alaska, families pay $982 per month for child care. But again, that, that varies. So I, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, there's, there is a role here. There is a role for us. Um, last, last Congress, um, Senator Tim Scott introduced the Child Care and Development Block Grant reauthorization. I, I co-sponsored that because I thought it was a good way to, to actually help assist child care providers and, and families in their ability to be able to choose child care without us here in the federal government micromanaging things. Senator Murray has, has a different approach to it, um, but I'm looking at this and, and suggesting that we have a role here. We have a role. And I perhaps might not have ever envisioned that at the federal level it was incumbent upon us to, to, to weigh in here when it comes to, to child care and access to child care. But it is impacting our military security. It is impacting our economic security when you cannot get people to be able to return to work because there is no child care for them. So if anybody wants to comment on Senator Scott's uh, um, reauthorization of the Child Care Development Block Grant, I'm happy to hear that because I've taken my full five minutes. <laughs> Apparently. Go ahead, somebody. <laughs> Ms. Hogan, you're picked on. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, what I really, I just, I, there's so much, it's, Wonderful to hear you talk about the role, and I just want to appreciate the opportunities to have bipartisan agreement to build on what we've already done to ensure that there is childcare and early learning access. And I especially want to lift up what you talked about in terms of 
this really not being a minimum wage job, that compensation needs to be commensurate with their incredible skills and value that goes into this. This is a difficult job. And the senator from Oklahoma, I know, isn't here, but this question of regulations, when we make a when we make it harder for an early childhood educator to do their job, when we reduce ratios and we reduce group sizes, one of the things that we need to talk about when we do that is we make it harder to recruit and retain early childhood educators. And so we actually reduce the supply when what we're trying to do is increase it. And that comes back to this question of the ways in which compensation really matters most. If we don't fix that, we're going to keep struggling with this challenge. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Kane. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. I, I think there is a uh, consensus, not a unity, but a, but a consensus that we've got to do something about this and a lot of debate about what's the right way to do it. Um, you know, the reality in Virginia, so I'm a, uh, I'm a parent of three kids. One is an early childhood educator in a, in a private a pre-K program, long-standing private pre-K program in Minneapolis. And I travel all around the state and talk to people at military bases and rural Floyd County and metropolitan Richmond, Hampton Roads. And whether I'm in a rural part of Virginia or in a really metropolitan part of Virginia, I hear the same story and over and over again, that um, we can't pay our folks what they're worth. If we did pay them what they were worth, a whole lot of our parents couldn't afford it. And then from parents, I can't find affordable childcare. And I'd like to be in the workforce but I'm not because of the inability to find high quality affordable childcare. At the same time as our unemployment rate is near the lowest it's been in 60 years and every employer in the state is telling me we can't hire people, we have got a massive reserve army of super talented people who would like to be in the workforce and they say they're not for one reason, they can't find high quality affordable childcare. Uh, Ms. Mormon, my kids in Richmond did early childhood experience, some home-based, family child care, some of the Virginia Preschool Initiative, two programs in church basements that were church-run programs. And I support all of it, and I supported all of it when I was uh, governor. And, and I guess you wouldn't be here today with us if you thought what we were trying to do was dictate a one-size-fits-all, Stalin-like government-run program, correct? You wouldn't, you wouldn't come and testify to a committee if that was what was up. In fact, you were talking about the value of the funding that you received during COVID. Uh, the first set of funding was, was part of the CARES Act, which was bipartisan. Democrats and Republicans together said, we better help out child care providers during this tough time. And then we did more in the American Rescue Plan, and that was just Democratic votes, only Democratic votes. But in the American Rescue Plan, we did child care. We didn't exclude family-based care. We didn't exclude family-based care run by faith-filled people. We said, we need you. We want to support you. And the proposal that Senator Murray and I have is to do that. It's not to do a one size fits all. It's to, it's to have a program that would support high quality, but high quality delivered in a million different ways, including programs just like yours. You were candid, and I want to dig in a little more, because I, th I thought you were candid on the salary issue. You're paying 12 bucks. The state says you can get some additional resources training if you can go to 17. But if you went to 17, um, how would that affect the parents who are coming to you? If I went to 17, I would have to increase my rates. And, and, and a number of your parents' families couldn't afford it, right? I would lose them. Right? Yeah. So this is the gap I'm hearing everywhere. My families struggle to afford this. My providers are worth a lot more than I paid them, but if I paid them that, then these families would be in a jam and you wouldn't be able to provide services to them. And that's the gap that I think we have to find an answer for. And I appreciate you kind of just stating it so clearly in terms of how it affects you, because I hear this all over the place. Um, I want to thank you, too, as I'm just continuing. This work that you did during COVID to call all of these child care providers in the family settings to say, you know, if you were running a daycare center that had, you know, 50, 60, 70 kids, you might be more aware of these resources out there. But like the place where my son Nat went first in life, there were four kids there. And Marie Williams, I doubt, would have known about federal funding available to help her over this tough time. What did you learn as you were reaching out to these 400 providers during this tough time that you might want to share with us? The money was crucial. It helped them to continue to be able to operate 
and serve the children that they had in care. Without those phone calls, providers would have lost out because it was, it, it was a deadline. There were no extensions. You had to act and you had to act then. And many providers were not aware because they were working. They didn't have time to check emails or to see what was going on. They were working, caring for the children that were in care. And just to you know, put an exclamation point on the value of the work that you did, this was also during a time where because early phase of COVID, we don't exactly know, you were having to grapple with social distancing issues that you might not have thought about. Three-year-olds aren't the greatest social distances in the world or so, I've noticed. <laughs> and, and secondly, you probably had a whole lot of parents who were facing issues at their jobs. And even as they were struggling to pay what you would charge them, now if their jobs are in jeopardy or businesses are closed down and things like that, right. they had even more needs. But you were able to not easily kind of stretch because of this federal assistance, stretch the fabric over the holes in the garment to kind of keep plugging along. That's what our assistance enabled you to do, correct? Definitely. Without it, and some providers did not make it. Yeah. because they weren't able to continue financially they just couldn't afford to continue to run their business well thanks for being a resource for others and i yield back to the chair thank you uh, senator cassidy i defer to senator marshall right thank, thank you senator cassidy and and chairman certainly agree with everybody here that child care is a significant problem it's nothing new in rural america it's now flooded over to urban america I think I've shared before with this committee, the toughest part of my marriage I remember is working 36 hour shifts as a resident, my, worst, my wife, the nurse, working 12 hour shifts with two preschool kids. <clears throat> uh, running a hospital, running a medical practice, childcare was always uh, a major issue, of course, for, for, for nurses. We've, uh, gosh, did a big round table at Kansas State University three or four years ago trying to bring in the best minds and what, what we could do and not do. Uh, beyond that, I think I did a dozen round tables this last week and at every one of those round tables, urban and rural America, this issue was brought up. I think what's interesting is each community has <clears throat> their own way to solve it and it's so hard for me to sit here and say this is one size that's gonna work for everybody. I, and even just hearing everybody's ideas up here, it's next to impossible to figure out what, <clears throat> what would work best. Probably the best solution I've seen is uh, Salina, Kansas took their YMCA and did a co-op there. So they had an underutilized resource during the day <clears throat> and different businesses uh, we're going to pay for a share, like five spots, seven spots, ten spots, whether they used them or not. So, that, so when you're running this uh, co-op, you would at least have a fixed income. So that was a very unique idea. I want to talk about the 45Q tax credit, though. <clears throat> Our, I, I hope some of y'all are familiar with this, but I think it's an opportunity for small businesses, but it's very tight what you can use it for or not use it for. But, but by expanding the 45F tax credit, I think it gives more flexibility to those people, those small businesses. Ms. Lucas, are you familiar with the 45F at all? Not really, I'm sorry to say. Ms. Laren, are you familiar with it? <clears throat> yeah, GAO looked at use of the uh, child care tax credit by employers a few years ago, and we found the take-up rate was very low. Um, and there are a number of reasons um, for that low usage. I think, um, for one thing, it's... Uh, um, Employers don't aren't really aware of the tax credit, right? Um, and it remains very expensive to provide uh, child care to employees. Um, but it is a, an option that's available to employers that is underutilized at this time. What would you do to expand it to make it more user friendly? Any any thoughts? You know, we didn't make any recommendations around that when we did the work. We were really looking at the use of the of the credit and challenges to using it. Right. Anybody else on the panel familiar with 45F? Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Sanders, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, I've been um, listening to this conversation, and I'm really struck as I think about what this sounds like at home in Minnesota, because at home in Minnesota, I can tell you that child care access and affordability is a huge issue. And it's not just an issue in the blue parts of the state. It's an issue everywhere. And in fact, I think most Minnesotans don't really see this as a political issue at all. Um, you know, in small towns and rural places, I hear from farmers and small business people and mayors and parents that child care is just not working for them. And that's what we've all been talking about. I think, there's, as uh, Senator Kane said, there is... Um, 
um, there's, there's you know, an understanding of that issue. Um, I think the question is, what do we do about it? And um, I want to just um, like focus in first on what we have done about it, because I, I want to dispel any myths that might exist about whether or not in the work that Congress did, Congress took action to shore up the childcare system because it was collapsing. If we hadn't done that, my understanding from talking to people in Minnesota is that this teetering on the edge of a cliff childcare system would be off the cliff. And there would be, it would be in a much different situation. That's what I'm hearing at home, just to give you an example, 96% of child care providers in Minnesota said that receiving the grant was helpful in keeping their program open and operating. 81% of people said that that was very helpful. Majority said that that helped them to retain staff. So it, it made a difference. It made a real difference. 8,000 child care providers were able to keep their businesses afloat. And I can tell you, I think this is probably pretty similar around the country. In rural parts of the state, that is more often than not um, family child care providers. Um, who are most at risk of um, having to close up because of the situation. So let me just um, go first uh, to you, Ms. Brodinsky, um, 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 talking about what you've seen in New Mexico. Um, your home state has been very effective in utilizing the child care stabilization grants. And could you just talk a bit more about how you, like, so how you were able to use those dollars to shore up the system and position New Mexico providers and families for a, a, a better system. Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, we put together a formula that made sure that we based it on license capacity, but we also wanted to incentivize infant toddler care and higher quality care and give more to centers and family child care homes located in what we call high vulnerability index right. communities. So we acted quickly with that. We similarly, as a state, we called every provider to make sure they knew about the opportunity. Right. Uh, and we thought that was very important, especially in our rural communities. Broadband access is very limited, so we knew that phone calls, text messages were going to be critical. And I feel good that we reached almost all of our providers. We directly talked to them, and they knew that the money was available. And you said also in your testimony that flexibility was so important, so, because if you agree, as I do, that one size does not fit all, that means that individual providers are going to have different needs. Some a small family <laughs> provider in the midst of that pandemic right. needed to make some physical improvements mm -hmm. to their space so that they were able to stay open, right? right. And, and um, the ability for individuals to be able to make their own decisions without the federal government saying, you must do this. That's exactly right. They were able to make choices about how they spent it with a, a, with a list. Most people did invest in salaries, but they did things like improve their outdoor learning environments. They made things more safe and healthy. Um, they it put filters in their houses or in their yeah. child care centers. So overall, again, they were much stronger by the end yes. of the stabilization. And that continues to reap benefits even though the fundamental market failure, I mean, I would say we have a market failure here. There's, you know, the supply and the demand, how much it yep. costs and how much... Uh, people are able to pay is completely mismatched. And that, those are essentially the problems that we are working to solve that Senator Murray and I and others and Senator Warren and I have been working to try to resolve. Not by saying you must have a child care system that is exactly this way, but by actually putting power in the hands of parents to That's make right. decisions about what that looks like. Um, Ms. Um, I'm about to run out of time, so I'm going to switch gears because I want to ask Ms. Mormon something that I think is really important for the committee to have on our minds. This actually isn't um, part of the jurisdiction of this committee, um, Senator Sanders, but it's really important. During the pandemic, the Department of Agriculture issued a waiver that allowed us to extend flexibility to provide um, through the child and adult care food program. Um, so home-based providers could be reimbursed for the food that they provided um, in their system. Ms. Um, Ms. Mormon, could you just I know you're a home-based provider. Could you talk briefly, and that, that program is going to expire if we don't take action. Could you talk just a, briefly about um, how, what your experiences were with that program and whether you think that there's things we should keep in mind as we look at whether it can be extended? Yes, ma'am. I participate in the child care, um, child and adult care food program, right. which is an important program and source of funding for child care community. However, major reforms are needed. Depending on where family child care educators live or their own income, we are assigned to a tier, tier one or tier two. In tier two, the already modest partial reimbursement rate is about half of the rate for tier one. 
Tiering only applies to family child care. It does not apply to centers or Head Start programs. In the 20 years since tiering was introduced, the number of family child care homes participating in the CACFP has decreased by 46%. Thanks to congressional leadership when the pandemic struck, the USDA had the flexibility to temporarily move all family child care programs to a tier one. Mm -hmm. We also received an additional 10 cents per meal or snack reimbursement. This was a lifeline as meals and child care programs are vital sources of nutrition for children. Children in my program for 10 to 14 hours per day and I serve two meals and one snack and a dinner for children who stay longer. I share your concern about the end of the waiver, which expires June 30th. The cost of food has increased significantly. The CACFP reimbursement only partially covers the cost of food, leaving us to regularly pay out of pocket to feed children. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Mormon. I know I've gone over time. I appreciated you bringing our attention to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm sorry to always have to interrupt you, but it's their fault. <laughs> it was my fault. I asked a question that I knew was gonna take more than eight seconds. Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Bud. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. And again, I thank the panel and witnesses for being here today. You know, I'm of the belief that parents should be empowered to make the best decisions for their family child care needs. And there really shouldn't be a one size fits all solution. I'm concerned that proposals uh, from my colleagues across the aisle from the Democrats on this committee would stifle parental choice by sweeping government intervention. Uh, to essentially take over the child care system in our country. Um, Ms. Lucas, can you go into more detail about something um, that you and Senator Tuberville chatted about earlier? Uh, can you go into more detail on why child care should not function like a K through 12 school? Well, um, yeah, there's so many reasons. <laughs> um, but um, I think that, the, that when you look at the youngest kids, um, we know that they have special um, needs. They need loving care. They are, people have a variety of different preferences. Um, many parents want um, home-based care and something that's a more loving and environment that reflects their values. And as we move to more towards basically just extending down our K-12 through public schools, I think we're going to lose a lot of that. And especially as we've seen with our K-12 through um, public schools, um, all this controversy and parents kind of waking up during COVID um, to recognizing that what was being taught isn't what they wanted to be taught. Um, the tremendous lack of learning that's taking place in K through 12, rise in violence in K through 12 education. I think there's just a lot to be concerned with. Plus school closures, um, there's a lot of failures in COVID that I think brought people to, to question what's going on in our K through 12 public schools. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so how can policy make, policymakers support parents who would prefer uh, to have one parent or maybe an extended family member stay home with the child? You know, I, I think as we're talking about this, there's so many great things that are going on at the state level, but I think that should give us humility. Like, why does this money need to pass through the federal government rather than having um, you know, states enact their own programs? A lot of states are doing great work in enacting very interesting programs to help those who need childcare, but without making it harder for people to keep a parent at home. And I do worry as we talk about all this money going to support one kind of, of childcare arrangement, and that's paying someone else to care for your child. Um, that we are effectively discouraging or disincentivizing um, not only stay-at-home parents, but grandparent um, and other kind of community-based relationships. I think we should be supporting parents through um, tax credits, through tax deductions, lower tax rates, direct subsidies, um, but not making it conditional on paying somebody else to care for your kids. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Cassidy for this hearing. Thanks to our witnesses for being here today. This is obviously a critical issue for um, all of us, for our constituents, for our families, and most importantly, for our kids. Um, so to Ms. Hogan, I wanted to start with a question to you. Unfortunately, many young children missed out on formative years of learning and socializing with peers due to the pandemic. A recent survey by the American Speech Language Hearing Association found that a large majority of speech language pathologists are reporting more young children who have delayed language or diagnosed language disorders and behavioral difficulties. Some of those students may require professional early intervention services, but parents and early childhood educators have an important role to play here as well. So Ms. Hogan, what steps can we take to ensure that child care staff receive the training necessary to support the healthy development of young children and their learning recovery? 
Thank you so much for the question. And it's true, we, we also are hearing that from early childhood educators every day, that they're seeing a lot of challenges that kids are bringing to bear and making sure, again, we've talked about how difficult it is for families to access childcare. This is particularly true for families who have children with yeah. disabilities and families who need non-traditional hours. So really making sure that educators, it speaks to this question of the complexity in early learning right. and making sure that early childhood educators have access to gaining those skills and competencies they need. And we've seen, again, states really go out of their way to make those investments in apprenticeships and scholarships and access to training and professional development that really supports early childhood educators and understanding across all settings how to support kids and their families. Well, thanks. I really appreciate that uh, because it is true when you have a child who needs uh, either a different approach or a more you know complex understanding of development, uh, it's really important for early childhood educators to get those supports and that training. Um, Secretary Groginski, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, along with Senator Young, I've introduced the Bipartisan After Hours Child Care Act, which would expand access to child care for Americans who work non-traditional hours, that third shift, sometimes that second shift, right? Lack of access to child care during these non-traditional hours hits families in rural areas especially hard. And I know um, Senator Smith touched on this in a, in a question, but Secretary, how are you increasing access to child care in rural areas and for families with non-traditional work schedules in your state? Um, the ways that we're doing it is really through all of these three mechanisms, making sure that we're paying for the true cost of care, yeah. expanding eligibility for families up to that 400% of poverty, and really investing in the workforce. We know that our child care programs need to stay open longer, and especially in our rural communities. We've seen children die because their families did not have access to child care, and they had to leave their baby or their toddler with somebody so they could go to work in one of those evening jobs. Yeah. So investing in child care is about improving child well-being overall. So all three of the things that we're doing in New Mexico are making a difference. Well, thank you for your work, and thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cassidy. Senator Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. I like these discussions because I come from the real world before I got here of how you actually try to fix these things. Uh, I remember uh, the gentle memories of when our kids were raised. It just wasn't this complicated. Uh, we had plenty of local providers. Uh, some of them, I wondered how they made it through the day, you know, with the pandemonium that seemed to be part of the process. Uh, everything needs room for improvement. We're talking about putting more responsibility possibly on the shoulders of the federal government. One of the reasons I ran is because if you're good at finance and you know the numbers, you kind of look a little into the future and I don't see a good business plan for this place to take on more responsibility. And I'm doing this as a problem solver, not really doing it in a political way. So. Uh, Senator Sanders and I had discussions. I think he and I have been the loudest senators on reforming health care. That's a broken system that uh, one side wants more government. Uh, we consider it maybe okay. It's not okay when it costs that much. Child care, because I visit all of our 92 counties, uh, a lot has to do with workforce there. You want more people to come into the workforce, you're going to have to have child care. And it, it worked years ago, it's just not working now. So my thinking is, unless you come up with real solutions, they'll generally get to this forum, and then you're stuck with more top-down and already kind of bloated system that doesn't really look warm and fuzzy in terms of the finance part of it in the long term. My question is, I'll start with uh, Ms. Bruginski. You've done something in a state um, I think that's probably where a lot of the solutions are going to get done sustainably and paid for over time. Do you think this should be something that we consider here on top of whatever we've been doing that looks like we're getting into financial chaos and I don't know what we've been knocking it out of the park on. You seem to have results. Mm -hmm. Can this be done in the bailiwick of states as opposed to trying to find solutions here? And where do you think it would be best done? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator Braun. I think um, we can't, the states can't do it without a significant federal investment. I think that's what we saw, and a federal investment that had the flexibility that we need. And right there, that's, to make you, sure you, you made a point there. Would you be willing to borrow the money 
from future generations to do it because back home and in businesses and anything else, you're finding out through the force of having to stay, live within your means, the solutions that really work. Would you really want more here if we're borrowing the money to do it? Because that's what you'd be saying along with wanting to help. Thank you, Senator Brown. Yes, absolutely. The benefits will pay off. The return on investment is clear. And in New Mexico, over 70% of the voters said, we want to have a constitutional right to early childhood education, overwhelmingly. I think nationwide is the same case. And we need to make that partnership between state and federal and local so that parents have the choice they need to go to work, invest in their children's future, and that will return to us in dividends that we can't even imagine. So what that'll do is pile on to our 31 trillion in debt, and we're wrestling with this right now uh, between two sides that I don't think are really taking it seriously. One side wants it 20 trillion out there in 10 years more. That heavy load of interest, I can tell you, is not gonna be good for what you want or for the other things, Social Security and Medicare long term. But I understand your opinion is that there wouldn't be the wherewithal. I do disagree but we're, with but that. We are losing, as Ms. Hogan said, $1.122 in lost revenue right now. So that is something that we need to think about when we make these But anything decisions. we're trying to make up on lost revenue, we're borrowing the money to do it. Uh, Ms. Laren, where are you at on this issue? Uh, clearly, people come here because they want money for things. If we were doing it responsibly, like you do everywhere else, it would be there. But you'd be making tough decisions of trading off what the best use of that money would be. Uh, can states do this on their own? And what do you think, if they got to look here, are you willing to borrow the money to do it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you raise a, an important point about um, states making decisions and the current system um, the CCDF um, program does allow states a fair amount of flexibility in how they use the funds. And that's part of the reason that we don't know how all of the current spending is being spent. And we won't know that for a few years. Um, and it's because different states are doing different things with that money. So I think that is important, having the flexibility at the state level. Um, I. I'm sorry, I think I missed the other part. Well, you, I think you made your point. I don't want to be gaveled by the chairman for going over my time, but I will put this out there. Unless all of us as citizens, all of us that want to solve problems, if we don't start doing some of that in ways that are resourceful and maybe from the bottom up, I do think we're going to run into issues of how we pay for it here over time. Food for thought. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Senator Luhan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to come back to a point that Chair Sanders uh, brought to our attention as well, and that was on the inherent conflict that exists in childcare. Uh, I, I, one area I, I hope that we all agree is that the wages that early childhood educators make is very, very low. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that we take a moment to understand what the impact on the system is, but on those kids. Um, especially um, some that may benefit from um, that curriculum, that social learning, um, and those that won't, and what that means into future years of prosperity in community and across the country. Now, what's incredible about this conflict is it boils down to subsidy rates. Mm -hmm. Most states use market rates, as was pointed out by our secretary earlier, um, to calculate their subsidy rate. And market rates report what providers are charging for child care, mm -hmm. which is typically only what parents can afford. And as was pointed out, artificially low. Mm -hmm. These low market rates keep wages low, revenues low, and supply low. Now, New Mexico became the first state in the nation, along with DC, to use these alternative methodology uh, to set rates. Yep. And, and I appreciate that. Now, Secretary Groginski, what kinds of factors went into the new methodology? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Senator Lujan. Um, really importantly was how much are we gonna pay our early childhood staff. So we set a floor initially at 1210. We've now set that floor to $15 an hour. But we're also looking at things that state laws require, like paid sick leave. So we, we put that into it, we put benefits. We make sure that there's enough staffing so that educators have time out of the classroom to plan for their children's uh, learning and development. So all of those things are modeled into um, the cost model and then we determine a rate, uh, we determine what that costs, and then based on our revenues and our sources, we set a rate that will be comparable and competitive. Now, Secretary, did using that methodology, um, the new cost model for rates, help to expand um, access for families for kids? Senator, it did. Uh, we've seen that we now have over almost 2,000 more license capacity than when we, pre-pandemic, and so we know that it was through this rate setting that was using a cost model that's allowed providers to breathe easier, to attract and recruit staff, and fully staff their classrooms. Now, New Mexico was able to make childcare accessible for nearly all families by increasing income eligibility, um, mm -hmm. uh, providing a path forward for these um, young um, people to be able to get access to these programs, yep. predominantly at no cost. Um, I always appreciate when folks remark on our budgets that they're a reflection of values. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that more and more people value access to these programs for our kids. Yes. Because I can attest that um, getting access to these programs, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Um, I think that's one show of success. Yes. Um, when we measure access to these programs and what it means mm -hmm. as well. Now, while federal emergency funds temporarily allowed this, there needs to be more flexibility in these federal programs, and I appreciate everyone raising that here as well. Now, Secretary, yes or no, should Congress make CCDBG funds more flexible by allowing states to expand eligibility beyond 85% of state median income, and especially in low-income states? Yes. Currently, the federal funds do not allow state grantees to use funds for facilities, renovation, or construction. Mm -hmm. This limits supply, mm -hmm. reducing access for um, not just choice for families, um, but especially for the kids. However, the federal emergency funds allow for facility investments. Um, so my question to you is, Yes or no, should Congress make the CCDBG funds more flexible by allowing facility renovation and construction? Yes, as long as there's increased funding. Head Start pre-K and child care programs have a profound return on investment as, been, as has been pointed out today. Mm -hmm. Now, Secretary, based on what you've seen in New Mexico, what is the return on investment for early childhood education programs? Yes, a few years ago, our Legislative Finance Committee did a study that showed our pre-K program produced a $6 to every dollar invested return. And we know now with these kind of investments in childcare, we're gonna see similar returns across the birth to five system. So yes or no, would you argue that the state's return on investment for early childhood education programs has increased after these federal investments created historic access and quality improvements in New Mexico? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cassidy. Thank you all. Um, Senator w Mark Wayne had to leave. Uh, he finished, he asked that I submit some articles to the record on his behalf. Without objection. Now, he brought up something in which, um, very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable, about how children were being judged by the color of their skin, at least implicitly, uh, not by the content of their character. And well, a couple of the things he asked to submit uh, shows that that was not a one-off. Uh, and it also, I just want to comment on this, uh, be very quick, but it's also introducing the young one to four year olds to the concept of transgenderism with multiple things in there to kind of promote the kind of aspect. Ms. Hogan, this is your organization. Are parents informed? Do you rec does your organization recommend to those using this material that they inform the parents beforehand the content of the material? So I'll just add that, I mean, our resource, Nacy's, and again, I'm not looking at what you're looking at, but our resources have been used by hundreds of But that's not my question. I, I understand that. Years. But my question is, do, 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 do you recommend that, your, that the people using your material tell the parents the content of the material uh, that their children will be, their one to four-year-olds will be exposed to? 
the resources that early the resources that are for early childhood educators to help ensure that but kids are uh, learning. You're, you're kind of speaking past my question, so I'm going to have to assume they're all done in partnership with families. So, the, the, so they do, you do recommend that the parents are informed that their child will be discussing transgenderism in their daycare. We trust early childhood educators to partner with. Families but there's no the formal programs. recommendation, and the reason I say that, and I think I can assume that because you're kind of I, I don't mean to accuse, but you're kind of ducking the answer. And the reason I raise that is that we start off, you know, he who pays the piper picks the tune. And we start off saying we're going to have this program in which, oh my gosh, faith-based, Miss Mormon, my gosh, you, you, you're going to have a statue in heaven, in which faith-based organization does positive things. Ms. Groginski, you obviously spread it around. But I've learned that once the federal government gets its kind of financial hooks in, it begins dictating. Good example is the adoption agencies, which formerly anyone, they, they could make their own decisions. And now if uh, you're a Catholic agency and you don't want to adopt out to a same-sex couple, you, uh, you get the wrath of the federal government. And so that begins to evolve over time. And I think we have to recognize that trend. Um, and I think that would give pause if we're going to make the federal role of financing so overweening. Um, Ms. Mormon. Uh, again, I've never seen a witness better prepared than you. I mean, I just want to compliment you right off the bat. But one thing you raise is that if it's hard for you to compete with a $17 per hour wage. I hear the same thing from Medicaid providers. I hear the same thing from hospitals. I hear the same thing from nursing homes. Frankly, I hear the same thing from fast food outlets. So if we specifically targeted uh, child care, as we're going to give you a bump so that everybody can pay at least 15 or 17 or whatever, uh, inevitably you'd pull from all these other uh, worthy organizations. Uh, is that fair to them? The need still does not change. The workers need child care. Child care needs other educators and we need each other. Mm -hmm. So together, we've got to do something. I accept that. I accept that. But except my role where I have the home health agency on Medicaid reimbursement, which is fixed, and the struggle that that owner has when she cannot pay her employees or attract them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something for us to recognize here. A little bit you're squeezing the tube of toothpaste. Um, Ms. Lauren, again, excellent presentation. I, I enjoyed what you had to share. And it made clear that the dollars that went out to agencies, that went out to child care agencies, in some case, you could have had a, a child care facility that had no kids whatsoever, um, but because everybody was afraid to send their child, but they still got the check, correct? Yeah, in the early days of the pandemic, that was the goal of these programs, was to stabilize the industry and keep the child care centers from going out of business Almost when there were no children. Even when there were no children. Correct. And I think that's important to recognize that this was a short-term thing. And the reason that there was an encouragement or permission of waiver of co-pays is that we're thinking the parents may lose their jobs because the pandemic shut everything down. So you wanted them to be able to afford should they lose their job or have to take a lower pay on one. So I think it's important to know the context of all this. In my remaining seconds, Ms. Lucas, you said something very good about allowing the dollar to follow the parent and the child. I will note in New York State, I'm told that there are 30,000 unfilled child care slots. By the way, it's been asserted several times that people cannot go to work because they cannot afford child care. That's actually an assertion. There's no data. It may be true, but there's no data. And the fact that New York has 30,000 unfilled, like, I would take your child, but I can't take your child. You, you don't want to send your child to me. Suggest that may be true. Any comment on that? Because I thought your point, it should follow the parent, was very good. Yeah, you know, I do think that there's um, that um, your parents know best, and they have a better sense of what options are, and they're going to look for um, value that makes sense for them. When I look at the Head Start program, um, you know, I, I notice how much more expensive each hour of Head Start is. You know, this is the one federal directly managed, um, you know, um, a federal program, and yet it costs, um, you know, almost in some cases, you significantly more per hour, and some, I think to compared to some states, nearly twice as much. Um, and the Obama administration had actually looked at trying to loosen Head Start so that parents could, um, you know, that Head Start would be required to provide more. But I think it would be better to give those parents better options so they don't have to go to Head Start, which provides relatively few hours and instead could take, take their business elsewhere to other providers who will meet their needs and the flexibility that they need. Thank you. 
Senator Murray. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing and for all of our panelists. We have a child care crisis. We can skip around words and pretend that curriculum's the problem or something else. We have a child care crisis, and we actually had a child care crisis before COVID. Yeah. But it was a silent crisis because parents did not talk about it because they were worried when they went to get a job that if they said, I don't know what I'm going to do with my kids, they wouldn't get that job. But the pandemic actually opened up this conversation and allowed us to see the reality in this country where we aren't taking childcare as a serious crisis. And we did make considerable investments at that time uh, with the American Rescue Plan and really helped some of that stabilize. But we are about to, I mean, it hasn't gone away and it's gotten worse. And I will tell you, everywhere I go in my state, People talk about the fact that they do want to go get that job, but they cannot because they're 200th on a waiting list. That's right. Or they say to me, yeah, there's a slot open, New York, but I can't afford it. It's half my salary. Exactly. Or I will have to work part time, which why am I working part time? That this doesn't make any sense. This childcare system doesn't make any sense. And to boil it down to a discussion about curriculum or masks is ludicrous. We have a child care crisis, and we need to deal with it as a country. And I will tell you, I am concerned that the stabilization funds that end in June are going to make it even worse. And that's a reality we have to face, and we need to decide what we're going to do about it. And we're going to have to decide how, what we do about the cost. Senator Kane talked about it. There is a dilemma between raising your prices so that you can pay your child care workers so you can open up more slots but then parents can't afford it. That is exactly why Senator Kane and I and others have introduced child care legislation and it really goes after that. Um, so to diminish this to a conversation about government run, I, I wanna put that to rest right now. And Ms. Hogan, let me ask you, we keep hearing this one size fits all, government run. Um, that's not how this is, works, it's how it's never gonna work and it's how it will not work. Um, and I would like you, Ms. Hogan, to just talk about how we put this together so that um, it is not a one-size-fits-all. Talk about the state-federal partnership and put this to rest for us. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, federal funding is not a federal takeover, and all of the proposals build on what we know works, and they support flexibility, they support and trust educator autonomy to decide the curriculum and the supports that work for them. So these aren't real about what's happening on the ground. What we know is really happening on the ground is that to your point, people cannot find or afford childcare and educators cannot stay in jobs that they love because they can't make what they need to make to be valued and stay. I think, you know, what we've heard today too is you know, parents want different things at different times, sometimes, in the diff sometimes different things in the same day. And so you can't, they need to be able to have those options available for them. Childcare isn't something you can just like turn on and off when families want it. It's gotta exist in order for, in order for families to take advantage of it where and when they want it. In a mixed delivery system that works we also, faith-based programs are incredibly important to NAOIC and to our entire system. I think 15% of parents use them, and it is incredibly important to be able to actually look at what the proposals offer in terms of investing in family child care, center-based, faith-based programs, centers and schools, and really have this system that provides for true family choice, which is not what families have right now. Ms. Griginski, can you add to that? I mean, I don't think in Mexico that you put out a one-size-fits-all, demanded curriculum, told people they had to do it this way or, or leave. Tell me how, yeah. how that works for Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murray. Such a great question. It's quite the opposite. We made the conditions so that they could work with families and develop the programs that families want. Expanding eligibility for families was key to our success. Families now have more choice. Providers now have more revenues. They can pay their staff better. But it's all in partnership. Everything in our regulations is you have to make sure families are involved, families know what's happening. So um, it's quite the opposite of a one size fits all, what's happened in childcare in this country. We need more federal investment though to make it stick and to make it work for families and businesses and fuel our economy. Well, exactly. And I think it's really important as a parent, I know every parent 
looks around. What is the best child care facility I can go to? What reflects my values? Um, knowing that this is part of what we have to do today. Um, that choice is critically important and is inherent in how our child care proposal is put together. So I really appreciate those responses. Thank you. Senator Murray, thank you. Uh, and thank you for all the work you have done and are doing on child care. Uh, Senator Cassidy, do you have a brief uh, closing statement, please? I do not. Okay, let me just thank uh, all of the witnesses and just, uh, just say this. Um, this discussion and how we deal with childcare is a real reflection on our national priorities. We talk about our love for children, the future of America is our children, but we don't put that into effect when we pay childcare workers $12 an hour, when we charge parents rates that are unaffordable, when we don't have enough slots available for working families. I don't think it's too much to ask that in the richest country in the history of the world, all of our children, no matter where they live, no matter what their background is, get the quality child care, early childhood education they need in order to flourish in life. I don't think that's a radical, socialistic, if you like, statement. I think that's something that the vast majority of the American people believe in. So I think it's time we got our priorities right. And if we get our priorities right, we put children at the top of the list. We reform child care. Federal government has an enormously important role to play. Let me thank all of the witnesses for your testimony, for being here today. We appreciate it very much. This is the end of our hearing. Uh, for any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, June 14th at 5 p.m. Finally, I ask unanimous consent to enter the record one statement from stakeholders outlining their child care priorities. So ordered, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>